The following is a class on the Srimad Bhagavatam, given by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jaya Jaganata Jaya Bala Deva Subhatra Mai Jaya Sudashana Jaya Bala Deva Subhatra Mai Jaya Sudashana Jaya Gauranita Jaya Gauranita Gauranita Jaya Gauranita Jaya Prabhu Pada, Jaya Prabhu Pada, Prabhu Pada, Shila Prabhu Pada. Jaya Om Vishnu Pad, Paramahansa, Paribrajat Acharya. Ashtatarasata Sri Srimad, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki, His Confounder Acharya, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Nijalila Pravishta Om Vishnu Pad, Srila Bhakta Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur, Srila Prabhupada Ki, Ananta Koti Vaishnavinda Ki, Namacharya Srila Haridas Thakur Ki, Prem Shri Goshi Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vindaki Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopa Gopinath Sham Kun Radha Kun Giri Govardhan Ki Vrindavan Maya Purdam Ki Ganga Maya Yamana Maya Ki Tosi Maharani Bhakti Devi Ki Hari Nam Sankirtan Ki Srila Prabhupada Guru Puja Ki, all glories assembled devotees, all glories assembled devotees, all glories assembled devotees, all glories Sri Guru Sri Gauranga, all glories Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Jaya Radha Madhava Kun 
Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Jana Bala Bhagiri Bharatari Gopi Jana Bala Bhagiri Bharatari Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Nitai Gaur Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Nitai Gaur Hari Bo. Jai Jai Prabhupada, 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 Prabhupada. Manandi Aribo Namaha Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Viranta Swami Niti Namani Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sunyavadi Paschacha De Satarine Om Namo 
भगवते वसुदेवा ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवा ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवा So we're hearing from the Brihad Bhagavata Amrita, the pastime of Narada Muni, and his search for the devotee who received the greatest mercy from the, the Lord. And we heard how Narada Muni had come to Prahlad Maharaj, and Narada Muni was glorifying Prahlad Maharaj that you're the greatest devotee of the Lord. But Prahlad was not happy to hear this. At the same time, he had to respond very carefully because Narada Muni is his spiritual teacher. So you should not argue with the spiritual teacher. Spiritual teacher says something to the disciple. You have to accept it. Just like one time Prabhupada was giving class. And then Prabhupada said to the devotee, you're sleeping. And the devotee said, Prabhupada, I'm not sleeping. Prabhupada said, you were sleeping. The devotee said, Prabhupada, I, I wasn't sleeping. Prabhupada said, if your eyes are closed and you're not moving, you're asleep. So the idea is don't argue. <laughs> right. Spiritual master says something. All right, so Prahlad Maharaj is hearing from Narada Muni. And one of the reasons why Narada Muni was glorifying Prahlad Maharaj was because uh, the Lord had given him, had showed so much affection to him. He had embraced him and he'd licked his body and everything. He cuddled him like a mother would cuddle her child, young baby. So Lord Nishringadev was showing so much affection to Prahlad Maharaj. But Prahlad said, this is not the sign of the greatest mercy. This was just some affection. But it's not the greatest mercy. Prahlad was saying the greatest mercy is given to the devotees who are given service by the Lord, who are engaged in his service. And Prahlad Maharaj cited the example of Hanuman as being a much greater devotee, that Hanuman had got much greater mercy from the Lord because he was engaged in the service of the Lord. And Prahlad said, I even fight with the Lord. I fought with him. So what kind of mentality have I got? You think I'm a great devotee. I, I fight against the Lord. Just sometimes because Prahlad is the king of the demons. So the demons are always fighting against the demigods. So in this way, Prahlad Maharaj said, I'm fighting against the Lord. So Prahlad also said, you think I'm a great devotee, but because I'm born in the family of demons and because of my association with the demons and because of my position as now I've become the, the ruler of the, the kingdom of Haranyakashipu, so the, the effect of all that, that power and opulence it's going to contaminate me. And I, oh, I will be inclined to impersonalism. And I will take to dry speculation. And with dry speculation, usually the conclusion is just simply impersonalism. So this is a result of my being born in a demon family. That I've gone off. I, I'm not keeping up the mood of devotee but I'm becoming impersonalistic and 
impersonalism is actually just like atheism. Because in the impersonal philosophy, everyone is God. There's no God and the living entity. There's only God. Everyone is Brahman. And so Krishna comes in the world. Krishna is a form of the Brahman. And we're also a form of the Brahman. So we're equal to Krishna. So we're all one, we're all God. So this is the impersonalist philosophy. And that leads to, of course, all kinds of sinful activities. Because I'm the Supreme Lord, so I can do whatever I like. Nobody can say I can't do this. So impersonalism is a very, very, very dangerous philosophy. It stops people from worshipping the Supreme Lord. Because if we're all God, there's no need to worship the Lord. Because we're all God anyway. So we worship, people end up worshipping themselves. That is ahangraho pasana. What is called in Srimad Bhagavatam, Ahangraho Pasana. The concept that we're one with the Supreme and we worship ourselves rather than worship God. So Prahlad Maharaj is afraid all of these things will happen to me. When I become the ruler, I'll become impersonalist. I'll forget my real position as your servant. And Prahlad, uh, oh, Narada Muni was also saying that Lord Nasringadev didn't, uh, oh, not Lord Nasringadev, uh, who was it? Uh, Bana, Banasura, oh, Lord Krishna didn't kill Banasura when he came there to fight with Banasura. He didn't kill Banasura. And Lord Nishingad, uh, Prahlad, or rather Narada Muni was saying the fact that Lord Krishna didn't kill Banasura was a sign of Krishna being merciful. And he was being merciful because of Prahlad. Because of Prahlad, he didn't kill Banasura. But Prahlad said it would have been better if he had killed Banasura. He should have killed Banasura. His mercy was not to let Banasura keep living and just cut off his arms and leave him with four arms. Originally he had a thousand arms, but Lord Krishna reduced him to a four-arm form. He said, he said he should have just killed him because Bana went against our family tradition. In the family of Prahlad, you have Prahlad and you have also Bali Maharaj. They were both worshippers of Vishnu. But this Bana became a devotee of Shiva. He went against the family tradition. Instead of worshipping Shiva, instead of worshipping Vishnu and, and, and Krishna, he is worshipping Shiva. So Lord, why did Lord Krishna spare him? It would have been better if he simply killed him. In this way, Prahlad Maharaj is uh, defeating all of Narada's proposals that he's been, that he's received the greatest mercy from Lord Vishnu, uh, from Lord Nishringadev. And Prahlad said also, you think the Lord is always visible to me? He's not always visible to me. Hardly, I hardly ever see him. He appeared to kill Haranyakashipu, and after he killed Haranyakashipu, then he disappeared. I never see him again, hardly. So this is Prahlad replying to Narada Muni. Of course, Prahlad is always chanting the holy name. He's always chanting, offering prayers to Lord Nishringadev, right? On Hari Varsha, in the, the region called Hari Varsha. Hari Varsha is one of the regions around Mount Meru in Bhumandala. 
Bhumandala. There's Mount Meru situated in Bhumandala and around Mount Meru, these different regions. One of the regions is Hari Barshan. And Prahlad Maharaj resides there. And along with the residents of Hari Varsha, they all pray to Lord Nishringadi. And they pray, kindly vanquish our demonic-like desires for fruitive activities. Please appear in our heart and drive away our ignorance so that we might become fearless in our struggle for existence in this material world. So in this way, Prahlad Maharaj is saying to Narada Muni that I'm not, I'm not a great devotee. Don't think of me as being a great devotee. Of course, this is the humility of a great devotee. One who is actually a great devotee will never admit to being a great devotee. If someone says, I'm a great devotee, then you know immediately he's a rascal. Anybody who claims to be great devotee, then they're fool number one. But the more we advance, then the more humble we become. And you see the example of people like the Goswamis of Vrindavan, how they were so humble. Rupa and Sanata and Ragana, how they were so humble, how they were falling at their feet, offering obeisances hundreds of times every day. And then also, of course, Haridas, Thakur, how he was also so, such a humble soul. He would not go anywhere near the temple. He would just sit on the beach and chant Hare Krishna. And every day Lord Chaitanya would come and bring him prasada. So that is the genuine humility of the pure Vaishnavas. We want to cultivate that humble mood. Hum to become humble means to give up false Pride. Pride is an intoxication. And as devotees, we don't take any intoxication. Right? We don't take drugs or smoke or gum or alcohol or any even Coca-Cola. We don't take we don't take caffeine because these are all drugs. So we don't get intoxicated. And we want to give up intoxication, both gross and subtle. So the subtle form of intoxication is pride. And we have to give up that pride. We say pride comes before the fall. Right? But we become proud, then next minute we'll be in Maya, we'll be out of it. We'll fall into the modes of nature. Prabhupada tells a story about the, the mouse that came to the yogi, right? Then the mouse said to the yogi, 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 help me. I'm being chased by a cat. So the yogi said, what do you want? He said, can you make me a cat? So the yogi said, then become a cat. And then the cat went away, but a little while later, the cat came back and said, Yogi, Yogi, help me. We said, what's wrong? He said, the dog is chasing me. Can you make me a dog? So the Yogi said, then become a dog. And then the dog went away. But then a little while later, the dog came back and said, Yogi, help me, help me. Tiger is chasing me. So the yogi said, okay, you want to become a tiger? Dog said, yes, let me become tiger. He became a tiger. But then when he became tiger, then he's looking at the yogi 
Huh? He's looking, his lips are, he's, he's getting ready. He wants to eat the yogi. His lips were ready to taste the human blood. So then the yogi said, ah, you want to eat me? Huh? Punar Mushtika Baba. Again, you become a mouse. And this way, the mouse learned the danger of pride. And so pride is such a problem. And don't, we, we say in ISKCON, we talk about being puffed up, right? We become puffed up, like the puri puff his, puffs up. If it's a good puri, you know, it will blow up. So we become puffed up, but of course, the puffed up puri will, will break, burst. So we have to be very cautious not to become proud, to keep ourselves always humble. Lord Chaitanya says in the Shikshastikam, Trinada pi suni chena tarora pi sahishnana. Right? Of, we should be tolerant like a tree and devoid of all sense of false prestige. Devoid of all sense of false prestige means our ego should be in proportion to our physical dimension. Yeah. Our ego should not be in portion to our physical, that it should be in portion to our spiritual dimension. Our spiritual dimension is one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair. So we should think of ourselves like that. One ten thousandth of the tip of the hair. Lower than the straw in the street. But our ego is in proportion to our physical dimension. We're thinking, I'm five foot eight or five foot ten or six feet, six feet four, whatever. That is the maya, you see? And so we have to guard against that and keep the ego in proportion to the spiritual dimension. So Prahlad Maharaj, being the pure soul that he is, he is very, very humble and he is offering all respects here to Narada Muni. He wants that Narada Muni will not be too angry or critical of him. Let's see. All right, well, we were hearing, um, Prahlad was quoting the Lord's real mercy is when I, when he takes away everything from him. And there are different statements there. We spoke about that yesterday. Such statements are evidence of the, the, the real mercy of the Lord. Not when he gives us something, but when he takes everything from us. Okay, and... Uh... So Prahlad said, how can I have any pure devotion? How could any pure devotion appear in me that would signify the Lord's mercy? I see proof of my lack of devotion. 
when I ponder the wickedness of my family members, people like Banasura. I have heard some say that now, after arresting and imprisoning Bali, the Lord stays here in Sutawa as a doorman just to keep him captive. In any case, I cannot say where the Lord is now. So Prahlad has admitted he doesn't know where the Lord is. But people were saying that Bali Maharaj is residing in Sutala Loka and Lord Bamanade was going to go there with him as his doorman to protect him. And it's actually described that Ravana at one point had gone there. And Ravana had gone there to see uh, Bali Mara to give some trouble. He want, you know, Ravana is a demon. So demons always create trouble everywhere. But when he came there to Satala Loka, Lord Bamana just kicked him. And he kicked him far away. So although Ravana was so powerful, Lord Bamana dealt with him ruthlessly. And then also it said Durvasa came there because there was some problem in the place which later on became Dwarka. There was a problem there. Durvasa came and he wanted to get help from Lord Vamanade. So he'd heard that the Lord is residing there at Sutala Loka. So he came to Sutala Loka. Durvasa came there to Sutala Loka and he, he wanted to see Lord Vamanade. Now, usually the Lord doesn't show himself to anyone, but this Durvasa had such a strong desire to see the Lord that the Lord came to see him. But Durvasa was just begging the Lord to come. He said, you have to come. I want you to fight these demons who are giving us trouble at this place. But Lord Vamanadev refused. He said, no, I can't go with you. He said, I promised to stay here. I have this, I'm staying here with Bali Maharaj. I'm not going anywhere. You have to deal with this problem yourself. I don't want to get involved with this problem over there. So you make some other arrangement to find somebody else. And this, anyway, the point was that Lord Vamanadev appeared to these different people depending on their particular desire, just like Ravana came there and then Durvasa came there. So they actually saw the Lord. But, but uh, Prahlad Maharaj said, I don't always see him. He said, very rare I see him. When he killed, when, he, when the Lord came as Nishringadeva and killed Aranyakashipu, at that time I saw him, but then he disappeared very quickly. And I never saw him again. So you're saying the Lord is all, but he said, I, I, hardly, I don't see him. Just like we'll hear about Hanuman. Hanuman also, he serves the Lord in separation. So Prahlad Maharaj, we see also again the mood of separation, service in separation. So I said on one rare occasion, some person like Ravan can see the Lord here. The Lord shows himself only when it suits him, when it suits his own purpose. He then showed himself in the very place, in the, this very place to Durvasa, because Durvasa had strong faith in being able to see him. Therefore, one develops an intense desire to achieve the Lord. There can be, there, there one can attain him. But the Lord's mercy residing in a certain place does not grant one his association. If my Lord were always present here in person, why would I have traveled all the way to Naimisharanya to see him as Lord Pitavasa, the yellow guard form of Narayan. So we told that story, how Prahlad Maharaj was going there to Naimisharanya to see Pitavasa. And at that time, Lord Narayan came and they fought together. And 
the fought for many days. Then Prahlad understood he was fighting Lord Narayan himself. And at that time, Lord Narayan said, I'm always conquered by you. We can say that by your mercy, the Supreme Lord developed some love for me. And so I, I appear glorious. But my greatness is just like a, a tiny speck before the heaps of mercy the Lord bestows on his newer devotees. So making the distinction about newer and older devotees, right? Older devotees means the Lord's eternal associates, like Garuda and the goddess of fortune. They're his eternal associates. But the newer devotees is people like Prahlad. Prahlad Maharaj. They're newer devotees. So the Lord has actually more interest in the newer devotees than in the eternal devotees. Why? Because the newer devotees accept more suffering. They endure more hardships than these eternal associates. The eternal associates of the Lord, they don't, they don't undergo all these difficulties. Like what happened to Pilate. So the Lord has, that's why the Lord shows special affection for them. So Prahlad said, O Narada, your heart overflows with causeless compassion. Why should I go on describing all my misfortunes, which simply make you unhappy? Instead, please consider the Lord's mercy on Hanuman of the Kimparushas. So as Prahlad Maharaj resides in Harivarsha, Hanuman resides in Kimparusha Loka. And this is a similar re in a similar region, which is surrounding Mount Meru in Bomondala. And there are great personalities living there. How to go there to Bomondala? Yeah. That's, well, some people, you know, they go through the Himalayas. From the Himalayas, you can transcend into this region of Oman if you're qualified. <laughs> very, very special. There are regions in the Himalayas which are just untracked. Nobody can know where they go or how to go. There are parts on this planet, regions on this planet, where things just disappear like the Bermuda Triangle, the Bermuda Triangle, big ships, airplanes, and they just suddenly disappear. Nobody, you never find them again. Nobody knows where they go or what. And so they go out somewhere from this world. The Kimparusha Loka is where Hanuman lives. And Prahlad Maharaj knows about it. And he's telling Narada Muni that you should go there. You should go and see Hanuman. He's a great devotee. Uh, Prahlad said, you know, I'm very small, insignificant. I'm just a speck of dust. But Hanuman, he's a great devotee. He's, he's like a mountain. I'm like a tiny speck of dust. O oh, Narada, your heart overflows with causeless compassion. Oh, yeah, I read that. Mm. Please note that the personality of Godhead appeared suddenly in the form of Narsimha just to kill my father. As soon as he fulfilled his purpose, he disappeared. I haven't been able to see my Lord directly whenever I wanted. So when I saw him once at the shore of the ocean, it was just like seeing a dream. So Prahlad Maharaj is describing his own vision of the Lord, that he saw the Lord only very briefly, just like in a dream. 
means not very long. Dreams are very short. We have dreams. Every night they say we have more than 30 or more different dreams. Our minds are so active. You know, we may sleep, but the mind doesn't sleep. The mind is active in dreams. So Prahlad says this vision, he saw the Lord, but it was so brief. It was just like a dream. The, he saw the Lord on the, at the shore of the ocean. The shore of the ocean, it doesn't sound like uh, uh, Ahovala, does it? There's no ocean at Ahovala. But anyway, this is where Prahlad Maharaj saw the Lord. Uh, it says that the dramatic setting in the palace on the shore of the ocean and the presence of many demigods and sages made it difficult for Prahlad Maharaj to express his feelings for the Lord. So what you, when there's many people around, of course, you won't be so intimate. Prahlad Maharaj was not able to show his real feelings for Lord Nishingade because all the demigods were watching. So all the demigods are present and they're all looking and they're seeing Prahlad Maharaj, they're seeing Lord Nishingade. And so everything was very restricted. You, you, they couldn't really reveal their true feelings. Prahlad couldn't reveal his love for Lord Nishingade as much as he wanted to because so many people were watching. So that, that is natural. But Prahlad Maharaj said, Hanuman, he is more fortunate. He's more fortunate because for many, many years, he has been serving the Lord. 13,000 years Hanuman was serving the Lord. After the Lord came back from exile, he came back and then he became the king of Ayodhya and he ruled undisturbed for 13,000 years. And he performed Agni Hotri sacrifice for 13,000 years. And that time, Hanuman was with him all the time, by his side, waiting to do service, whatever service was required. Then Hanuman would be there to do it immediately. There's a story that Lord Krishna wanted to show the devotees the mood of spontaneous devotional service. So he told Garuda, he wanted to show Garuda what is real spontaneous devotional. He told Garuda, go and tell Hanuman, come here, I, I want to see him. So Garuda went off to Kimparusha to find Hanuman and told Hanuman, Lord Krishna is in Dwarka, he wants to see you. And Hanuman, yeah, didn't do anything, didn't react. So then Garuda came back to Dwarka, he told Lord Krishna, he said, I told him. He said, what did you tell him? Krishna said, what did you tell him? I told him you wanted to see him. He said, why you told him that? He said, you should tell him Lord Rama wants to see him. And so Garuda went back and he told Hanuman, Lord Rama wants to see you in Dwarka. And so immediately Hanuman jumped up and Garuda said, I can take you on my back. I can carry you there. Hanuman said, it's okay. I'll go there myself. And so Garuda got back to Dwarka. Hanuman was already there. Just to show the spontaneous attraction which Hanuman has for the service of Lord Ramachandra. So, this is Hanan, Hanuman, he is famous for his mood of service, to give service to the Lord. 
in the nine angas of bhakti. Dashya is one of the nine limbs of bhakti. And Hanuman is the example of the devotee who became perfect simply by serving. So we see, for example, the Pandavas, the Pandavas, they don't do sadhana. They're not sadhakas, but they're always his friends of the Lord. They have that friendship relationship with the Lord. So they, they, their sadhana is in their friendship with Krishna. And similarly, Hanuman's sadhana is in service to the Lord. Of course, Hanuman, he also does sadhana. He's a, he's a great brahmachari, right? Hanuman is a brahmachari, just like Narada Muni. They're both brahmacharis. So Hanuman is a great brahmachari and brahmacharis, they study. And Hanuman likes to study. He knows a lot of Shastra and he can recite verses. And Hanuman also writes poetry. He writes nice poetry, glorifying Lord Rama. So Hanuman has many wonderful qualities. We know how much he fought for Lord Ramachandra. And not only for Lord Ramachandra, he will also come to help, sometimes he comes to help Bhim, because Bhim and Hanuman are brothers. They are both born from the wind god, Vayu. And it is said at the time of Hanuman's birth, Hanuman, when he saw the sun rising in the morning, he wanted to grab the sun. He was attracted to the sun planet. and He was going to jump up and get the sun, take the sun out of orbit. And when Indra saw what he was going to do, then Indra had to stop him because, you know, if you take the sun out of orbit, if you do anything to the sun, then it will upset the whole universe. And so Indra, as a king of heaven, it was his duty to stop him. So he fired some... Uh, Astra at Hanuman and knocked Hanuman unconscious. And so at that time, when Hanuman was knocked unconscious, his father, Hanuman's father, Vayu, was so angry that he stopped everyone from breathing. And he wouldn't let anybody anymore that the, the breath of life was no longer there. And people were all suffocating. And all, everybody was suffocating, the whole universe. People were all suffocating because Vayu was so angry that they knocked my son, they made my son unconscious. So at that time, all the demigods, they all came to Hanuman and they all came and they brought benedictions and blessings and they revived Hanuman. And when the demigods all came and gave their blessings and benedictions to Hanuman, then Vayu became pleased and people, life came back to normal. So Hanuman got blessings from the demigods that he would not suffer disease, he would not suffer old age, he would not even die. So he's one of the Amaras, right? So this was Hanuman. From his childhood, these things happened to him. So he was very, very powerful, very strong. So when Lord Rama was searching for Sita, then it was Hanuman who jumped across the ocean, a very long way, jumped across the ocean to Lanka and he found Sita. And he brought news of Mother Sita back to Lord Rama. So Lord Rama was so pleased with Hanuman that Lord Rama embraced Hanuman. Now, usually Lord Rama doesn't show any affection because he's the king. The king is always up on the throne, you know, giving blessings. But when Hanuman came with that news of Mother Sita, then Hanuman got an embrace from the Lord. So Hanuman is always remembering 
the Lord embrace me. And he's always thinking, when will I again get the embrace of the Lord? He wants it. That look. So that is Han Hanuman's in the mood, Dasya Ras, you see? Dasya Ras. It's different. Narada Muni is also Dasya Ras. So they, they both have that mood to be the servant. So Hanuman, he did many wonderful things. Of course, they're all described in Ramayana. We all know these pastimes, they're all well known, nothing very new. So they're not discussed much here in the Brihad Bhagavata Brita. Sanatana Goswami knows that people are aware of these pastimes of Lord Rama and Hanuman and his feats in fighting on behalf of the Lord. Hanuman fought for the Lord. And he also fought, as I said, at the battle of Kurukshetra. Sometimes when there was trouble, he could also come because he was there on the flag of Harjuna. And the benediction was given by Hanuman that if there was any danger, he would, he would come and he would make such cries, loud crying, shouting, that it would terrify all the enemy. So during the battle of Kurukshetra, it was like that, that Hanuman would sometimes come yelling and shouting, screaming, and everyone would become terrified. But in the battle of Lanka, of course, it was Hanuman who helped so much for Lord Ramachandra to defeat Ravan and Kumbhakarna because Hanuman had had the opportunity to go to Lanka on his own. He'd gone there and he'd seen everything. He'd been around the kingdom of Lanka. So he knew many different points of strategic things and he could tell everything to Lord Rama. And when Ravana's brother Vibhishan, when Vibhishan came there to join the army of Lord Ramachandra, it was Hanuman who recognized him. And Hanuman brought him to Lord Rama and he introduced him to Lord Rama and told him that he is your devotee, that he is actually worshipping you and you should, you should accept him. We should accept him into our sight. So this was all arranged by Hanuman. Others were suspicious that Vibhishan, he's the brother of Ravan. But Hanuman, he knows Vibhishan is good. He's a devotee. He's worshipping Rama. He's not worshipping Rava. Okay, so some more things about Hanuman. Of course, Hanuman, he, he, in the mood of service, he went to the Ganga Madana mountain and he brought that special herb which was needed to revive Lakshman. When Lakshman was hit by the weapon of Indrajit, he was not unconscious. And it took Hanuman to go there to the Himalayas, to Ganga Madana mountain and bring the herbs back. And he, he, but he didn't know which were the herbs, so he brought the whole mountain. And he said he went there twice, not once, he went tw had to go twice. So this is his mood of service. And you see that kind of mood. Madhavendra Puri, how has his mood of giving service to the Lord? When the Lord comes in his dream and tells him, I want sandalwood. I want some sandalwood. I want some camphor to cool my body. So Madhavendra Puri, he's in Vrindavan, and he goes all the way off to Jagannath Puri to get the sandalwood and camphor for the service of Lord Krishna. So this is the, the mood, this is the selfless mood which these great devotees have, that they give everything for the service of the Lord. Whatever order comes to them, this is mercy. And they go off just like Srila Prabhupada went to America 
he was ordered by the Lord, or Rupa Goswami anyway, said came to him when Prabhupada was staying in Radha Damodar in his room at Radha Damodar there. Rupa Goswami told them, told him, you go there, I will arrange everything. Don't worry. Just go there and write your books. And so the, the, this is a mood, selfless surrender. Just like devotees go out every day to distribute books. It's the same mood. It's selfless surrender, going out for preaching, going for the service of the Lord. We don't go out to get rich. We're not going out to make money, but we're going out for as a service, to give service to Krishna. Because we are the servant. He is the master. And we are the servant. So the more we have that mood of selfless service. Then that is our purification. That is how we can come to the stage of pure Krishna consciousness. That whatever Krishna wants. Just like Prabhupada would tell the devotees. You go there, you do this. And devotees, there were no books, there was no money, but still Prabhupada said, you go there. Prabhupada told the one devotee, go to Eastern Europe. He said, Prabhupada, there's no vegetables, I have to eat meat. Prabhupada said, then eat meat, but go there. And the devotee went there. And this is how the Sankirtan movement goes on. It's all based on service, selfless service. Okay, are there any question? Any comment? Question? Yes, Prabhu. <laughs> Are they what? Are they still? Uh... Yes. Yeah, they're still there. Right. Yeah, they live there. I said Hanuman got the benediction. He would die. Right. So he's there. He's there. And Prahlad also, he's in Hari Varsha. They're there. It's described in the fifth canto Srimad Bhagavatam. How they're living there. And they're worshipping the Lord. In different regions, they worship different forms of the Lord. Prahlad Maharaj is worshipping Lord Nishingade. Hanuman is worshipping Lord Ramachandra. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhu. Krishna Maharaj, thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the Pandavas, their uh, uh, sadhana, or they didn't do sadhana like we know it, but more uh, uh, they were in the Sakya Bhav. So, do we understand that they had passed through and they were in that Bhav stage to uh, be able to associate with the Lord like that? Uh, um, in terms of sadhana, how, how do we understand? Uh, well, well. They're eternal associates of the Lord. They're eternally liberated souls. So how do how do they how did they come to that stage? You know, they're eternally in that stage. You know, that is their relationship with Krishna. That they have that position. Prabhupada said, wherever Krishna goes, Arjuna goes with him. And Krishna will speak the Bhagavad Gita. And Arjuna will be there to inquire. Of course, the Bhagavad Gita, the form may change in different places, but basically the same principles are being explained. And Arjuna is there to share and to answer, to, and to give the impetus to Lord Krishna to speak the Bhagavad Gita. So they, they, they have that 
re relationship with Krishna, that it's always there. As this creation is eternal, so they are also eternal. They're eternally liberated souls. Then they have their pastime with the Lord. Different demons come, different demons come. They're also special souls, the demons who take part in Krishna's pastimes. They're not ordinary souls. So we say, Sambhavami, Yuge, Yuge. These pastimes are going on eternally. Eternally is happening in different, in different, uh, periods of Manu, different Manus, different Manvantaras and so on, there will be different, the, the Lord will come again and again. It's not just once, but the Lord comes again. And same way Lord Narsingadev comes different time, again and again. Lord Varaha comes different time. And Lord Vamana, they're all appearing. And these pastimes are going on continuously in different yugas and different Manvantaras, different days of Brahma is happening. You are saying that Banasra was not killed, was yes. left with only four hands. At least he would have got liberated if he had been killed. Huh? At least he would have got liberated if he had been killed. So why Krishna did not give that mercy? Well, he gave Bana the benediction that he could stay with Lord Shiva. He was told to stay with Lord Shiva and associate with Lord Shiva and serve Lord Shiva. And this way he got mercy of Krishna. He was very proud. Bana was very proud by his 1000 arms. And at one point even he approached he approached even Lord Shiva. He said, I don't, there's nobody else who can give me a good fight except for you. And so Bana, because he had so many arms, he was always looking for people to fight, somebody to fight with him to give him a good fight. He couldn't find anybody to give him a good fight. So even he approached Lord Shiva, he was going to fight with Lord Shiva. But they, they didn't fight. But it happened that Lord Krishna came and attacked the kingdom of Banasura. And at that time, Krishna cut off the arms of Banasura and left him with four arms and told him that he should stay with Lord Shiva and just serve Lord Shiva. So that is liberation, to be with Lord Shiva, associate with a pure devotee. And the association of Lord Shiva, Bana would be definitely benefited. Right? This Pune um, Mushtikabhava, that story you said. Uh, there's another one also I heard that uh, giving to unqualified people the boon, whether they are qualified or not qualified, giving the boon. Boon. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, that also should be stopped. That also should not be done. That's why this uh, unqualified, that mouse and uh, became a cat. He was just giving that uh, mercy. He was yeah. just giving that boon. Uh -huh. So like that, when we are distributing books and other things, can we give it to, you know, can we see that we are qualified or not qualified? Maybe Mahaprabhu's mercy is a Prabhupada's mercy is that we have to give to everybody still. If somebody is offender and um, is not appreciating our movement, it will not cause more uh, offense. He will do more offense when we speak or uh, how do we balance that? Well. We know the ninth offense is to instruct the glories of the holy name to faithless persons. And so we have to know how to benefit people. You don't want to t try to instruct them about the glories of the holy name. They don't have faith. So what we want to do is create faith. We have to create the faith in people. And once we create the faith within people, then you can give them more benefit. You can help them to understand more. For example, the glories of the holy name and the 
the glories of the Supreme Lord. We have to teach, before we can explain who is Krishna, we have to explain who they are. If people don't know they're not the body, then it will be very difficult for them to understand Lord Krishna. To understand the actual nature of Lord Krishna, first we have to understand who we are, that we're not the body, we're spiritual souls living in the body. Then from that, then you can go on to understand more about Lord Krishna. When you want to understand Krishna, we have to have faith. We have to have faith. And so that requires, for example, the chanting of the holy name, Krishna Prasadam. You know, if people don't have any faith in Prasadam, then of course we won't want to give them any real mercy or benedictions. If you give them Prasadam and they don't honor it, they refuse it or they throw it away, then it's very bad. So we're very cautious about how we, who we distribute prasadam to. So we want to create faith in people. There's a chanting of the holy name. We try to, we want to instruct people in the chanting of the holy name, the Sankirtan movement, let them join in the Sankirtan, get a taste for the holy name. And then from then you can go on to give them more blessings. Actual bless, of course, devotees. When we bless someone as devotees, we bless them that your mind may your mind always be fixed on Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, and Matir was too. May your mind be fixed on Lord, Lord Krishna. That is how we give blessings to people. So, of course, as you say, not many people may want that blessing. Oh, just bless me that I can be rich. Oh, just bless me that I can live a long time. Oh, just bless me that I can get my daughter married like this. You know, the people want so many silly blessings. But the actual blessing which we want to give is may your mind always be fixed on Krishna. That is the real blessing. Okay. Maharaj, there is a question online. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Pranam. Thank you for the wonderful class. May I request you to explain why Prahlad Maharaj fought with Lord Narayan? Why Prahlad Maharaj fought with Lord Narayan? Yeah. Well, because he's the king of the demons. And Lord Narayan is always helping the demigods. So Prahlad Maharaj was fighting for the demons. So they fight against the demigods. And when they fight against the demigods, then Lord Narayan will help for the demigods. So it's like that. You know, you're born in the demon family. Prahlad Maharaj being born in the demon family and he's the king, becomes a king, the ruler. He's obliged to lead the, the army of the demons. And they, they fight the demigods, the conflict with the demigods. So that's why we fought. Hare Krishna Maharas, Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I have one confusion, and lastly, you have explained that uh, we should give our service selfless. So, how can we do the selfless service more and more? What the question? Huh? How to do selfless service? Uh, well, selfless service means we do it for the pleasure of Krishna. You do. You don't do it for your own sake. If we are selfish, then we do it for our own self, right? We think about our own self. What am I getting? But if you're selfless, then you think about, you want to do it for, for Krishna, for his pleasure. So that's it. 
the idea of Krishna consciousness, to become conscious of Krishna. Whatever we do, yat karoshi, yajashnasi, yaj, like that, all that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away, as well as all austerities you may perform, do them as an offering unto me. Uh, this karmarpana, whatever we do, offer it, do as an offering to Krishna. That is selfless service. Do it for Krishna. I'm cleaning the floor for Krishna. I'm washing my cloth for Krishna. I'm chanting for Krishna. Everything like that. That, that is self, selfless. When we're thinking to do everything for the satisfaction of Lord Krishna. Mm. So we, we want to have that kind of consciousness. Just simply thinking that I'm doing this for Krishna means we don't worry about the results, but we want to do the service. It's a service which is pleasing rather than the result. You may get good results, you may not, but the, the main thing is that we're trying to serve Krishna. No, Krishna wants everyone to work. Nobody can be idle, not even for a minute. So when we're working, we work for Krishna. Do it for Krishna. That's why we come to the morning program every day. We come for Krishna, for Krishna's pleasure. Krishna's pleased to see all the devotees here in the temple every day. Krishna's pleased when we're chanting and dancing. Krishna's pleased when he sees us all taking his prasada. So we try to, we want to do everything in Krishna consciousness. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur, just like when we take prasadam, before we take prasadam, we will recite the, uh, the prasadam prayer, Sharira Avijajo, like that. So that is the idea to, the idea is to take away the mundane conception because we may be, just be thinking, oh, well, breakfast, oh, my, my food, like that. We're not thinking, so much in service to Krishna. So we recite that prayer and it purifies our consciousness that this prasadam is Krishna's mercy and I'm taking this prasadam to help me conquer the tongue, right? Of all the senses, the tongue is the most voracious and difficult to control. It is very difficult to conquer over the tongue. But you, dear Krishna, are so kind. You have given us this nice prasadam. So now let us take this prasadam. Like this, we offer this prayer. Bhakti Vinod Thakur is guiding us how to become selfless, even in taking prasadam. Because when we take prasadam, we can be quite selfish. But we can become selfless by that prayer. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Okay, Shrila Prabhupada ki, go back to Brenda ki.